What do we imagine when we hear about an atomic bomb? Well, a huge bomb in the belly of an airplane or under the fairing of a missile, a bright flash and a huge fireball that consumes everything for miles around. But among the scary ideas of the Cold War, there were not only increasingly huge and powerful weapons, but on the contrary something small, seemingly modest and because of this sometimes even more frightening. Today on the horizon, a hellish threat hidden in a bag. In 1945, the United States tested an atomic bomb for the first time, becoming the world's first nuclear power. In 1949, the Soviet Union tested its own bomb. The next decade was the era of an unrestrained nuclear arms race, when the frantic pace of building up arsenals by both powers and the no less frantic development of nuclear technologies, primarily of course weapons, went hand in hand. Different designs, different materials, different power levels. Physicists admittedly did not hold back their imaginations, creating everything, from giant thermonuclear bombs, which barely had enough heavy strategic bombers to deliver, to nuclear mines and ammunition that individual soldiers could carry. And while many have heard about the Tsar Bomba or Castle Bravo, not much attention is paid to various little things. And in the conditions of World War III, it would be so cool to have something big and powerful enough to, you know, I've got one round. The idea of making not only the largest possible bombs, but also the most compact ones, appeared almost immediately. The first point in the campaign for compactness was the creation of nuclear shells that could be used by artillery. Bomber aircraft with nuclear weapons were not numerous enough to manage to be everywhere at once. This task was completed quite quickly in the United States with the creation of the W-9. This projectile was tested in 1953 during a series of tests in the Nevada desert. Those famous shots of a huge cannon firing and a 15 kiloton nuclear explosion seconds later. However, the projectile with a diameter of 280 millimeters, a length of 1,390 millimeters, and a weight of as much as 390 kilograms cannot be called very compact. Engineers and physicists went further. And the results were very impressive. Projectiles such as the W-33 appeared, which with a weight of 110 kilograms and much smaller dimensions, could be used by 203 mm M110 or M115 howitzers. The power dropped to the range of 5 to 10 kilotons, but progress was evident. The best option was the compact W-54 bomb, born in the late 1950s. This device was originally created for two applications, for the recoilless gun, which became known as the Davy Crockett, and for the AIM-26 Falcon air-to-air -air missile. The W-54 belongs to the class of sub-kiloton tactical bombs. In theory, its power could reach 1000 tons in TNT equivalent, about 15 times less than the power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, although in practice it was even weaker. Several modifications were created. The first one that was placed in the Falcon missile had a power of about 250 tons of TNT. It was believed that an explosion of such power would ensure guaranteed destruction of enemy bombers, in conditions when the missile guidance systems of that time were not very accurate. The Falcon, by the way, turned out to be quite popular and was installed in American high-speed interceptors. However, over time, when the accuracy of missiles improved, the nuclear warhead was nevertheless replaced by a conventional one. The second impressive option were the M28 and M29 Davy Crockett guns, which were equipped with a super-caliber 279mm projectile weighing 34 kilograms, power 20 tons of TNT. Which, of course, is not very much for a nuclear bomb, but we have a small cannon here, packing two mothers of all bombs in one shot. Not bad. Disadvantages range from 2 to 4 kilometers and mediocre accuracy. The potential deviation could reach 50 meters. The shape of the projectile clearly wasn't helping here. The nuance of the Davy Crockett was that 34 kilograms were the weight of the entire projectile, and the device itself inside was even more compact and weighed only 23 kilograms, making it one of the most compact and lightest of its kind. 
And then the military thought about another project, a compact bomb that could be carried and used for example for sabotage actions. The idea itself was not new and was already known under the acronym ADM, Atomic Demolition Munition. The US armed forces already had in service a similar T4 bomb, which was also a modification of an artillery shell with a W9 bomb. The disadvantage of the T4 was that it wasn't very compact. With a weight of 73 kilograms it had to be disassembled into several parts, to be carried by four people and assembled on site before detonation. Not good enough to be James Bond's toy. Having the W54 on their hands, the military decided that the problem of weight and all this assembly and disassembly could be solved. This is how the Special Atomic Demolition Munition or SADM project was born. Work on the project began in 1960 and reached the finale four years later. In the process, the original device had to be seriously modified, so the index also changed, albeit with a reference to the original. The final result was the B-54 bomb, with a diameter of about 30 centimeters and 45 centimeters in height. It weighed 26 and a half kilograms. Quite a compact and lightweight option that could fit in a relatively large bag and be carried by one person. Controlling the bomb, given the conditions of use, was quite simple. At the bottom of this barrel there was a protective lid, locked by a rotating combination mechanism, like a safe. When the lock is opened, the lid is removed, revealing access to a control mechanism with a detonation timer, which can be set to a range from 5 minutes to 12 hours. In addition, there is the possibility of remote detonation. The blast yield of the bomb was not officially declared, but given the experience of the Davy Crockett, it can be assumed that it may be slightly weaker, possibly about 10 tons of TNT. For James Bond, the SADM of course is also too large, but for special sabotage units it was quite suitable. It is known that at least the Green Beret Special Forces units learned to use the SADM, including training to penetrate the Warsaw Pact countries. Such special forces were called Green Light Teams. In each detachment, three to four people accompanied one bomb. One was working on the device, the rest were covering. This should have been enough. Much better than the T4, which needed four just to carry it, plus an unknown number of people to provide cover. They were supposed to be used, obviously for sabotage purposes, for mining and destruction of infrastructure objects such as bridges, tunnels, ports, dams, airfields, factories, power plants, warehouses and so on. Moreover, both for mining objects in Europe during the offensive of the Warsaw Pact troops and for blowing up objects in the rear, where saboteur groups with bombs had to be dropped from the air from airplanes, or from the sea from ships and submarines. When their own forces were attacked, these forces were to be used to protect the flanks. The bombs came with fairly extensive instructions, describing exactly how to mine a particular object, with details about correct placement, explosion power, radiation emissions and so on. For the sabotage groups themselves, this work was considered extremely dangerous and in many potential scenarios suicidal. Yes, the instructions included procedures for camouflaging the bomb, plans for a quick retreat and even tools for remote detonation. But in practice, in war conditions, everyone understood that instruments and timers could fail and they would have to guard the bomb until the last moment and then they might not be able to escape. And this is not counting radiation fallout, also not at all good for health. The green light teams sometimes compared themselves to the Japanese kamikaze pilots. Everything related to the SADM devices and green light teams was classified as secret. Participants were strictly prohibited from discussing anything related to these devices. Thus, for the first time, the real existence of SADMs was publicly announced only in 1984, several years before they were withdrawn from service. This was due to several factors. Firstly, the strategy for their use involved penetration into the territories of other countries and large-scale nuclear sabotage, which is not usually advertised in public politics. Secondly, this strategy revealed the fact that there were hundreds of nuclear bombs the size of a walking bag stored in the arsenals of both the United States and Europe and it would be desirable for as few people as possible to know about this. 
The third factor came from the second. Full-fledged nuclear bombs are low mobility, heavy and large. They are stored in strategic warehouses under extremely careful security. Meanwhile, these devices, not intended for bombers and ballistic missiles, were scattered across somewhat more accessible military bases. With the growing threat of terrorism, many experts began to have anxious thoughts about what would happen if a couple of these bags were lost. How quickly would it be noticed, and how effectively the responsible parties would be able to react to it? Actually, the peak of discussion on this issue was in the 1980s and 90s, when even Hollywood loved to scare the average person with an inconspicuous man walking around Manhattan with a nuclear briefcase on his shoulders. Fortunately, it didn't come to the point of using the SADM, especially considering military parity and the understanding that in the USSR such tools also existed and would also be used. The development of the nuclear deterrence strategy and the end of the Cold War made these devices ineffective, and given the potential threats, it was decided to get rid of them. According to official data, the SADMs were withdrawn from service in the late 1980s, and the green light teams were disbanded. Probably. Comment what you think about these mini-bombs, like and subscribe to the channel. There are still a lot of interesting things on the horizon.